Amen. Martin Luther King Jr. Um, in his autobiography tells a story um, about one night when a brick came flying through his window, crashing into his kitchen. Um, and he also that same day got bomb threats uh, towards his family, towards his kids. And he tells this story where he would sit, he sat at the dining room table and he said, I'm going to sit here all night, God, because I want to hear from you. And he tells a story about how he stays up all night and he's saying, God, I know that you're calling me to this movement. I know you're calling me to this movement, but, but I need to know now that you're going to come with me, that you're gonna, your presence is going to go with me because now it's getting too difficult because now it's about my family and it's about my babies. Let the threats come to me. Let the threats come to my life, but not to them. And so he prays and he pleads with God and he says that, God, I need to know that you're going with me in this. And he, say, and he talks about how all night he has that prayer. And in the morning, the morning comes and, and he feels that, okay, I know that God is calling me to this. I know that not only that, but God's actually going to be with me in this. And so he continues on and the rest is history. But as he was kind of exp explaining this and talking to the autobiographer, writer, I don't know. Uh, but as he was telling the story, he says that that moment that moment was actually the defining moment in all of the, the whole of the movement was that moment. It wasn't Selma. It wasn't I have a dream. It wasn't Birmingham jail. It wasn't any of those other ones, but it was that moment that was the defining moment that, that Dr. King said, I know that from now on I could draw a line in the sand that God is calling me and God's going to go with me in this. Another story in the Bible of, a, of, of rescue and liberation is in Exodus 33, 3. And this is the story of Moses as he's leading the people out of Egypt and into the promised land. And, um, and this is the story about um, traveling in that desert and, and, and God speaks to Moses. And there's some golden calf issues that go on and like he just, I don't know, God's like, okay, we need to talk. And God says this to Moses. He says, Verse 3, God says, Go up to the land flowing with milk and honey, but I will, not go among, I will not go up among you, lest I consume you on the way, for you are a stiff-necked people. God is saying to Moses, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to offer you your, the promised land. This is the thing that you've been, we've, been, we've been planning for and preparing for, praying for, and knowing that God's bringing us to this promised land, and, and we're excited. Moses knows that I'm, I've been leading these people. It's been tough. I just can't wait to get to the promised land. And God says, okay, I'm going to give you the promised land. I'm going to give you the land with milk and honey. I'm going to fulfill the prayers. I'm going to fulfill the, 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 the dreams of your heart. I'm going to do all that, but I can't go with you. But I can't go with you. My question for us this morning is what would our response be to that? That if God said, Mikey, I'm going to give you all the desires of your heart and I'm going to answer your prayers and I'm going to give you all the, the Powerball 2.4 billion. Come on. Um, that happened this week. Largest lottery in the world. What if God came to you and he says, I'm going to give you $2.4 billion. You don't have to worry about a penny for the rest of your life. And not only that, generations to come from your family, you don't have to worry about any of that. But I can't, but I can't come with you. My question for us this morning is, is how valuable is God's presence to us over just him answering our prayers? Does that make sense? Like, what, what, where do we, where do we, what would our response be to God if God says, okay, you can go into the promised land, but I can't go with you. Moses' response is in 13. Exodus 33, I'm sorry, 14. 33, 14. He says, and Moses said to him, if your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up, out, bring us up from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not your going with us so that we are distinct? So this morning, my, my heart and my, my, my prayer for myself and for each of us is, where do we place God's presence. 
in our life. How valuable is that? And what I mean by God's presence is simply this, is that those moments, those moments in our life, those moments in our day that we just know he's there. You know what I mean? Like he, we just know he's there. It's, it's a, I remember for me, it was uh, the, the first time I experienced this true, tangible presence of God. It was, um, I was probably, I don't know, 19, 20 years old, just a couple years ago. And I, I remember that I was, I had just become a Christian a couple years before that. And there was a group of us at a summer camp and we were worshiping on this island. And I remember just, there was something tangible about this presence of God that just radically changed my life. It was just radically moved me where I was like, I, I, from that point on, I was like, I need, to, I need more of that. I need, I need his presence more and more. And maybe for some of you in here, you've experienced that. And you've experienced that, those tangible moments of, of God's presence. And maybe some of us haven't. That's okay. Let's stick with me. But I bring this up for us because I think that those moments and that presence is actually what draws us to intimacy with him, that draws us to intimacy with God. It, those are the things that we can hold on to when, when our worlds crash. When, when, when we get the phone call, when we get, when we get the, uh, the, the news, when we get the, the broken relationship, whatever it may be, whenever life happens, just a cute little church service won't do it. What we need is something bigger than that. We need a touch. We need a presence of God in that moment. My prayer for us is that this morning could be a defining moment for us. A de defining moment for you. As Dr. King says, that that was a defining moment in the entire movement that I knew God was with me. And that for, the, for me this morning, what I want is I want us to experience his presence over just experiencing church. And obviously there's there is an enemy, there is a barrier, there are barriers to this and that you know, we kind of all come in and we're like, that's great, Mikey, that, that's, that's fun, that sounds great. We know that there's a bar there are barriers that kind of keep us from that presence and, and that, that intimacy, that longing. And, and so I'm gonna go over a couple of them just to kind of um, give us some uh, kind of a mirror to be able to look at ourselves and be like, I know this is, this is where I'm at in that. This is, this, these are some of the barriers in my life that I know that maybe are keeping me from experiencing that presence of God. And I, there, are, there are endless others. There are countless other ones. And um, I hope you know that me sharing this and me, me going through these is not a, a way of, of trying to put guilt or shame on us or to make us feel bad, but it's a way of us to be able to expose what's actually going on on the inside so that we can actually then push back against it. Because you can't, you can't push back against something that you don't know is there or you don't realize is there. And so I'm going to go through a couple of these barriers to the presence of God because I think that, I think that this morning could be that defining moment. I, gen, I truly do. It's been, my, it's been my prayer for myself and for us all week. And so a couple of the barriers that are, that are barriers to the presence of God. The first is sin and shame. Sin and shame. Something, something keeps us from experiencing that presence. And oftentimes it's sin and shame. And I know for some people in here right now, I bring that up. I even say the word sin, I, I say the word sin, and you immediately know, okay, that's, that's me. You immediately know, okay, not only is that me, but I know exactly what he's talking about. Maybe it's a secret sin. Maybe it's, a, uh, maybe it's an external sin. Maybe it's just something that you're just like, I'm just, this is just the way I live my life. But there's something, and you immediately felt that reality that that's me. And sin is, is damaging in the moment. Sin is damaging in that moment, absolutely. But what comes more damaging later is the thing called shame after. That there's some people in here right now, all of us walked in here with sin in our life. That's, yes. But it's that shame that follows that's holding us in a place to say, I'm not worthy or I'm an imposter to even be sitting in here right now. 
And I believe that there could be someone in here thinking I'm an imposter for even sitting in and listening to this and watching people worship and and reading these lyrics. and, And I just feel like an imposter. Can I tell you you're not? You're not an imposter. This is exactly where you're supposed to be. What's the most godly thing you can do in the midst of sin is worship. The most godly thing you can do in the midst of sin and shame is to turn and worship Jesus. Repentance is exactly that. It's, it's to turn and look again at Jesus, to turn and see Jesus again for who he truly is. And that's what actually changes everything about us is that once we see him, we begin to be changed. So the first barrier to this presence of God is sin and shame. And that just being aware of that is so important to us this morning. The second one, second one is, um, I don't know if you've heard of Brother Andrew. Nobody? Okay. Um, Brother Andrew is, um, he was in ministry and a missionary for 67 years of his life. Uh, He recently passed away, and um, he was a part of starting Open Door Ministries, um, which is a ministry that uh, that is like a kind of an international uh, ministry that kind of goes all over. And um, he he actually had the um, one of the coolest nicknames. Um, His nickname was God's Smuggler. Yeah, my nickname is Mikey. Big difference there, but, but his nickname was God Smuggler because what he did is he smuggled Bibles behind the Iron Curtain back during the Cold War. So that's what this man did is he, he would go behind the Iron Curtain and, and bring Bibles into the midst of um, hostile territory. And he was asked this question, or I'm sorry, he was quoted saying this. He said, persecution is an enemy the church has met and mastered many times. It's indifference that we must watch for. Indifference is far more dangerous foe. Indifference meaning apathetic, a lack of interest, concern, marked by no special liking or disliking towards something. What is the next barrier to the presence of God? It's indifference. Revelation 3.16 says, So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. What is one of the barriers to the presence of God is indifference. Indifference. Are we okay with coming into church and going through the motions and then, and then leaving and never really experiencing the presence of God? Are we okay when we come in here watching other people experience Jesus? Are we, are we okay with watching the band up here worship? It reminds me of, I don't know if you guys have heard, but the Houston Astros are the greatest team in the whole world. Um, probably the greatest team ever. Um, but they won the World Series last, week, last weekend. And I remember watching the World Series and, and watching it on my TV, and, and I was just losing my mind. It was great. Our family was there. We were high-fiving. I wore my hat for, like, the rest of the week, and, and everyone, like, that saw me, they're like, hey, congratulations, man. Good job. You guys won. Way to go. And, and I remember thinking, I had nothing to do with this. Like, I, me, I was thousands of miles away screaming at a TV and cheering, and I had nothing to do this. I was watching a group of guys that had been practicing and preparing for decades to win and be the greatest team of all time. It's fine. Um, but it's like, that's, that's what they've been doing. And I think so often, sometimes that's us at church, is that we watch the TV, we watch the screen, we watch what's up here, and we're okay with just celebrating that they're experiencing it. We're okay with not being on the team. We're okay with just being a spectator sport of it, but we're indifferent to actually engaging and actually saying, I need the presence of the Holy Spirit. I need the presence of God today, and I cannot be indifferent to it any longer. Church and Christianity is not a spectator sport. It's something that we are engaged in and involved in. How often do we come in here expectant, how often do we come into church where we're just like, I, I'm, I'm, I'm here. I'm, I need to experience Jesus today and not just sing a great song and not just listen to a good talk, but I need to experience him. 
Or the other six days of the week, when are we indifferent to even experiencing the presence of God the other six days of the week? When's the last time I was reading this verse and, and God convicted me? Psalms 42, 1 and 2, he convicted me with, Mikey, when's the last time you prayed like David prayed? In Psalms 42, when he says, as a deer pants for flowing streams, so, my, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? Mikey, when's the last time you were not indifferent to the presence of God, but you leaned in and you, you pleaded that you could have his presence This, this, this psalm is not a cute little coffee mug psalm. It's like, as the pier, and it's a cute little dog, deer bouncing through the, the, the river. It's a pier, it's a pier, it's a deer panting in desperate need for water. It's a deer desperately needing the presence to be before his God. It's David saying, Lord, I need to be in your presence. I need to be with you. I need to be around you. It's not just something that's going to happen. I need to, I want to, I plead and I fight for it. Indifference is killing us as a church. My hope is pray, and prayers is that we don't walk out of here and get in our car and just think, okay, let's go to, let's go to La Coretta. But that there is a, there is a longing and there's a de desperation in our hearts to say, I need the presence of God. I can't keep going on. Life is too hard without the presence. Life is too hard with just church service. I've got to have Jesus. The best part about Christianity is Christ himself. The best part about Jesus is Jesus. We've got to have him. But indifference is a much greater foe. And lastly, the barrier, the last barrier to the presence of God is busyness. Busyness. And this has been going on since the beginning. Adam and Eve, you know the story, they ate an apple. Probably not an apple, but they ate an apple. And what happened next? They ran, they hid, they made clothes, they argued, they blamed. They sinned. And right after their sin, what did they do? They busied themselves with a bunch of other things because they wanted to hide from the presence of God. Busyness. It's much easier to avoid God and be busy than to stop and rest in his presence or stop and be known in his presence. We've mastered the art of hurry. We become a generation of good people, but not very deep Christians. Thomas, uh, Thomas Merton, a writer and a theologian, when asked, what is the greatest spiritual disease of our time? He said simply, efficiency. What's killing our spiritual desires in life is busyness. Our culture is suffering from a mental health, what mental health professionals call hurry sickness. It's a sickness that mental health professionals have now termed hurry sickness. It's a behavioral pattern characterized by continual rushing and anxiety. And we all know that, that we can wear bu busyness as a badge of honor. It's just like, I'm busy, I'm busy. And hear me, busyness is not a sin. To be busy is not a sin. It's a blessing in a lot of, lot of ways. It really, it truly is. Being busy is not the sin. It's when busyness controls us. We have to put busyness in its proper place what robs us of intimacy. How many know this? When we get busy, when we get stressed, when we have anxiety happening, how many know it's, it's real hard to love your loved ones? How many know it's real hard to be patient and kind and, and care when we know how busy life is? We know that, that bus the, 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 just the, the anxiety of life is just pouring down on us. Or when we're, when we're so busy that we're in traffic and we're just like, this is me, I'm guilty. I, uh, more, my wife knows. But when we're in traffic and we're just busy and I just have all these things in my head and, and I'm just getting angry at people because they're not, they're not abiding by my rules, you know? Busyness is robbing us of intimacy. B 
busyness is robbing us of the presence of God. And so I tell you these things not to, not to shame or to make us feel bad, but I tell you these things so that we can be aware. And we can know that, that, that yes, there is sin and there is shame that, that keeps us, but then there are also some things that are not sinful, like an indifference or a busyness. So it just brings, t- brings to mind some of these areas that keep us from the presence. And I want to I go through a couple practices that will help us actually engage and actually experience the, uh, the, the presence of God. But, but understand that um, these, these practices are a lot like golf in the sense that um, anyone golf? No, don't do it. It's frustrating. Um, <laughs> But I uh, started golfing um, recently, and it's a horrible sport. I'm just kidding. I love it. Um, but you watch, you watch, like, professional golfers like Tiger Woods, and, like, I think there's others. I don't know. That's the only one I know. But you watch, the ti- you watch Tiger, Wood and Tiger Woods, and he golfs, and it's, like, the easiest sport in the world. You put this white ball, and you stick it on a little stick, and then you hit the ball as far as you can. Like, it's simple. It's the easiest thing. You turn your body, you turn your hips, and you just crank it and see how far you can hit it until you actually try to do it yourself. And then it's the most frustrating thing in the whole world. Um, These practices are going to sound kind of like that, that you're going to hear them and they're going to be like, yeah, that makes sense. Okay, cool. But then we're going to try and it becomes so difficult. And so I just want to say that up front. The first one is this, how we can experience the presence of God is pray. Pray as you can. Pray as you can. What I mean by that is that um, I, I grew up in church and I've grown up listening to sermons and it's so hard to like, you know, I'm reading a book about monks right now, which is just so frustrating because I'm like, they pray for like seven hours. Like, this is crazy. And like, I think that like, that's what is expected of me. But hear me when I say pray as you can, not as you can't. Meaning, if you can't pray for an hour, don't pray for an hour. Pray for five minutes. Do you follow me? Pray as you can, not as you can't. But pray. Prayer is the number one weapon, number one connection, number one um, avenue to the presence of God that we have. Pray. Let me give you three things about prayer, or three things to help you in that. Is set a time set a place and set a timer. Um, Set a time. Pick a time that works for you that you can do it. This isn't, I know this isn't new stuff. I know, I know it's not deep revelation, but, but hear me, do it. Like, let's do it together. This is something that I've been convicted of in my own life. Like, I need, I need to, to begin to put these practices in too. Let's pray. Let's, let's pray as we can. Set a time. What time works for you? Morning, midday, afternoon, night, whenever it is, pray. Set a place. What place works for you? Where's a place that you could do it? In your car, in a closet, in a bathroom, at a lunch break, whatever it is, set a place and pray. And then set a timer. Set a timer. This is one that I just have recently heard and I love it. But it's set a timer because how many know that prayer can be stressful because you're like, I got to leave in 20 minutes and so I'm going to start praying. And then every three minutes you're looking at your clock. Set a timer. Say, I've got to leave in 20 minutes. I'm going to set a timer for 15 minutes, and I'm just going to pray. I'm going to go before the Lord, and I'm just going to pray, and I'm going to seek his presence because that's what's actually going to hold me and anchor me. Set a timer, and then when that timer goes off, you're like, all right. But pray as you can, not as you can't. And one more thing with prayer is I, I, I would encourage you or challenge you that when you pray, Set that timer for two minutes and just be silent. Just be silent and allow the Holy Spirit, allow God to actually speak to you. Allow him to talk to you and just, and just set it for two minutes and just say, okay, I'm just going to sit and I'm going to let God just speak to me. I'm going to let him just talk to me and I'm going to listen. We live in a very, very busy, loud, rambunctious world. And, and I think that sometimes we, we kind of take that world and jump into prayer. And we're like, okay, God, here's what I need. Here's what I got. Here's what I got going on. But let's just stop and actually say, okay, God, speak to me. Speak to me. Holy Spirit, speak to me. Uh, just, be, just be quiet and listen. Number two, the way we, number two way to experience the presence of God 
is Sabbath as you can. Sabbath as you can. Mark 2.27, Jesus says, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Exodus 20, verse 8 through 10, it says, Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all of your work, but on the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. This is one of those commandments that we all know, but it's not like, it's not like the do not murder and the do not steal and do not commit adultery and do not... Because those we get and we're like, oh, those are, those are non-negotiable. Like, we should not murder. Agreed? Cool. Um, but Sabbath... Eh, I'm a little bit too busy to Sabbath. And so often what happens is that we, we negate the Sabbath because we're just too busy and we just don't think it's important. Can I tell you something that, that over and over and over in the, in the Psalms, God, or David says, be still, be still, be still. That word still is the Latin word vacate which is where we get the word vacation. God's saying, take a vacation with me. He's saying Sabbath. You need a Sabbath. Meaning one day a week, as it says, six days we do the work, you get all your work done. And then you take a Sabbath. God had to remind me of this too. He says, you're not that important. You can take a day off because you need it. We need it. So often that, that, that'll push back against this busyness. We have to have a Sabbath. It's a, it made it in the top 10. We Sabbath. What is it? It's a 24 hours. 24 hours of you saying, you know what? I'm going to allow myself to rest. I'm going to, re, I'm going to re, retract from work and doing and striving, and I'm going to allow God to do it. And I'm just going to rest. But Sabbath as you can. It's going to look different for everyone. I mean, there's singles in here. There's married people. There's married with kids. There's um, older. There's, uh, there's all kinds of people in this room. And so we Sabbath as we can. What does Sabbath look like for you? That's where you, you got to figure that out. What does that look like? For us, it's Friday nights to Saturday night is a Sabbath for us. That's how it looks for us. We just, and we do what, what fills us up what gives us life, what gives us joy. We, we just Sabbath. We rest. Sabbath as you can. I love that in Matthew 11, when Jesus says, Matthew 11, where Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. He says, and I will give you rest. How do we do that so often? We do that with Sabbath. The last one is this. The last one is don't stop. Don't stop. The first is pray. The second is Sabbath. And the third is don't stop. Because I know that there's some of us in here that we've been doing this for a while. We've been doing this for decades. We've been doing this for years. We've been doing this for days. We've been doing this for months. We've been doing this. We've been praying and we've been saying, God, I need your presence. God, I need you to be real with me. I need you to show me yourself. And we're praying and we're pleading and we're saying as a deer pants. And we, maybe some of us have been praying that. And it just doesn't seem like it's working. It doesn't seem like it's taking for whatever reason. Let me be the one to encourage you and say, hey, I'm with you. Don't stop. Don't stop doing it. Don't stop praying. Don't stop Sabbathing. Keep doing it. Keep trusting that it's going gonna, it's gonna to pay off. Galatians 6, 9 says, Let us not grow weary in doing good. For in due season we will reap a harvest if we don't give up. I think the defining moment here is that God's presence can change everything. My prayer is, is that we experience that. Because we all know life happens. And the thing that holds us is his presence. And so let's pray. Let's Sabbath. Let's take those rests. Let's, let's, let's spend that time with Jesus. 
maybe for you, someone in here, that you don't, this doesn't, this is foreign. That as, I, as you hear me talking about even the presence of God, you're just like, what? That, that doesn't even make any sense. And maybe it's because you, maybe, maybe you have not given your life to Jesus and, or maybe it's that you just haven't experienced that. That's, that's okay. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pray for us and I would encourage you to pray along with me. Use your own words if you want, but pray and let's, as Dr. King said, let's have this be a defining moment for the rest of our life where we say, I know that on this date that God's presence was with me that God's presence was real, that, God's, that, that I, can, I can move forward knowing that there's a line in the sand saying, now I'm, I'm with him and he's going with me. And maybe it's you giving your life to Jesus for the first time. But with every head bowed and eyes closed, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pray. And I'd ask you to pray with me. Jesus, Lord, God, we thank you that you are a God that's close. Jesus, in this, we ask that you would make yourself known to me. Jesus, would you, I, I, we ask that you would, you would come into our heart, you would come into our mind, you'd come into our life, and you would be Savior, you would be God, you would be Messiah, you would be King, Lord. We ask that you would, would, would make yourself known. We trust you. We give our life to you. We give ourselves to you. We ask that you would save us. In Jesus' name, amen.